Bienvenue à tous. Welcome to Reporters here on France 24, our in-depth look at the big stories making the news. In this edition, we take you to the heart of the struggle to rebuild a city, if not a whole society, devastated by a massive explosion. The army in Lebanon are in the middle of an ongoing humanitarian mission. And for these soldiers, it may well turn out to be the biggest fight of their careers. Beirut is still shaken by the blast of August the 4th. The port was mostly destroyed and the effects on every level are still being felt by people there. Our reporter, Zena Antonios, has been to Beirut for this edition of Reporters. Uh, Zena, tell us a little bit more about the reconstruction effort. The reconstruction uh, in Beirut has already started, but it's quite uneven. Uh, some people have tried to reconstruct their houses or their shops uh, by their own means. Uh, other people are relying on the NGOs to help them uh, replace uh, their shattered windows and doors before uh, winter starts in Beirut. Um, the latest estimates for the reconstruction uh, made by the World Bank are $2.5 billion. Zena, thank you very much indeed. Let's then take a look uh, at the report from Beirut by Zena Antonios and Shabel Aboud. The port of Beirut is left with nothing but an endless pile of rubble. On August 4, 2020, a large amount of ammonium nitrate stored in a warehouse caught fire, resulting in two explosions which destroyed swathes of the capital, killing around 200 people, injuring more than 6,000 others, and leaving 7,000 families homeless. The enormous shattered grain silos cast a shadow across the port amid piles of debris, charred cars, and gutted sheds. For a country already torn by a political crisis with unprecedented socio-economic consequences, the disaster was the final blow. Many blame it on the ruling class, whom they accuse of incompetence and corruption. Whilst the government dithered as to how to respond, the Lebanese army stepped in. Regarded as the last symbol of unity and the only state institution still functioning, the army swiftly deployed to the scene of the explosion and the affected areas, preventing the capital from disintegrating deeper into chaos. General Jean Nahra and his men quickly cordoned off the area. Their role was to secure the location for further investigation. The army's mission was to investigate, to cordon off and preserve the blast scene by protecting the port and its surrounding areas. A special unit from the army was tasked to seal off the port after the explosion by closing the main entrances to prevent people and vehicles from entering, except for investigators. When Beirut was declared a disaster city, aid poured in from countries around the world. The scale of destruction prompted the international community to mobilize support for Lebanon. French President Emmanuel Macron was the first head of state to visit the country in a move he labeled as a token of support and friendship. Macron dispatched the helicopter carrier Thunder with humanitarian aid and qualified personnel on board to help in the rescue and cleanup operations. Colonel Youssef Haidar worked closely with the French military. The collaboration was excellent. It was easy to work with them because we could combine our resources. We carried out heavy duties because we had large machines on site, whereas they had small ones. So every time we had a site to work on, we'd meet the day before to decide which equipment to use and which teams to allocate for the job. The French were not alone. UN peacekeepers also came to Beirut's aid. Italian Colonel Andrea Cubedu led the Unifil task force deployed in the port. 
UNIFIL was able to provide assistance to the Lebanese people and the Lebanese army here in Beirut. Our task force comprises around 150 men and women from UNIFIL, the United Nations interim force mainly deployed in southern Lebanon. When we got here in Beirut, the situation was very bad following the explosion. We had to carry out an operation to clear out the area and to dismantle warehouse structures. Warehouses here were full of materials which had to be cleared away. In addition to military aid, dozens of countries donated tons of food for the thousands of people made homeless overnight. The supplies are packaged in this hangar for distribution by the army to the affected districts. Civil society groups urge the international community to donate directly to NGOs, bypassing the government whom they hold responsible for the blast. Which is why donations have been handled by the army, an institution which most Lebanese still consider to be apolitical and in the service of the people. Ever since the beginning of the crisis on August the 4th or on August the 6th, rather, we started receiving food donations. We've distributed 65,000 food parcels up until now. We were tasked with distributing these parcels to two types of beneficiaries, humanitarian organizations and hospitals, as well as families and homes. The explosions generated seismic waves equivalent to a magnitude 3 earthquake. Their homes were so badly damaged that many had to abandon them in the hours following the blast attracting thieves and looters from other parts of Beirut. With no policemen around, the army stepped in to maintain order. Several measures were taken around the area. We mainly patrol the streets in our vehicles or on foot. We constantly monitor these patrols and were stationed in certain areas to protect properties and people from theft. We've arrested several people. Most of them were caught trying to infiltrate damaged properties. Life seems to be returning back to normal in the historic Jemaize district, a few steps away from the port. L'école des Trois Docteurs, the oldest school in the capital, was partly destroyed. This was a library, and as you can see, the wall is completely cracked, so we had to support the ceiling to be able to empty the room. We cleared everything. The shelves all fell down. And this space has yet to be fixed because we prioritized the classrooms first. Imagine there used to be a big door here. The Lebanese army secured this 19th century building with the help of the French military. Just after the explosion, we received a team from the French embassy who came with rescuers, first from the French civil society, who initially helped us to implement minimum security. Through them, we've established contact with the French military engineers, who work closely with the Lebanese army. I think it would have been difficult and costly to get by without help from the army. At the other end of the street, Claudette has been running a sewing workshop for over 10 years. She didn't wait for help from the authorities to repair her shop. On the day of the blast, she was working when her window shattered. Claudette survived, but part of her stock is gone. She has received food supplies and support from the army, but she needs financial help. Two months after the explosions, the authorities announced they would distribute 100 billion Lebanese pounds to compensate the victims, the equivalent of a million 200,000 euros. Many are yet to receive their share of an amount considered by most to be way too small for so much destruction. Min 
They called us three weeks ago saying there was help for us. We thought it was compensation for the damage. We got there and found out it was food parcels from the army. What can food parcels do for us in this kind of situation? Everything's destroyed. We've lost our appetite anyway. Tony, a hairdresser who's been working in the area for 20 years, was hurt slightly in the blast. He was quick to replace his window and resume work. Like many others, Tony gave the military a detailed report of the damage done to his salon. He says he's satisfied with the work done by the army. When the army took control, we were reassured. We felt our belongings were in safe hands when we left the area on the night of the blast. The army did a good job securing our belongings. When we returned the next day, we saw that people were devastated. Two days later, the army came to see us. They settled in that store over there. The soldiers started registering claims for compensation from the ones affected in the neighborhood. I can still hear the sound of the explosion in my head. And every time I pass by this neighborhood that's dear to me, I cry. Because it's no longer the Gamais I know. The people are devastated. There's no one left in Beirut. Hats off to the army for everything it has done. I don't have any complaints there. Months have passed since the deadly explosions rocked the Lebanese capital. Time is slipping by, but the heartbreaking scenes of destroyed buildings remain and people are still recovering from their wounds. Many lambast the government for its inefficiency and lack of accountability after an investigation of the blast that remains inconclusive. But people are trying to rebuild their beloved city so that Beirut can once again rise from its ashes. Meanwhile, the Lebanese army is still carrying out its duties in a country still locked in the throes of agony. Our reporter, Zena Antonius, is still with us. Zena, thank you very much for that report. We saw how the Lebanese army is really involved in what's happening, but it's not just the army, it's the NGOs too. Tell us more about what they're doing. The Lebanese people, uh, hand in hand with the NGOs, have proven over, over the past year they, they, that they can stick together, that they can help each other, um, despite what one would think about the Lebanese people. Uh, with the help of the NGOs, uh, they have been able to rebuild, reconstruct, but also the people, uh, just a few hours after the blast, uh, they went uh, to the, the zone where the blast uh, happened and they offered to accommodate people. Um, they brought them clothes, food and everything. And I can say that uh, without uh, uh, Lebanese people sticking together, I think a lot of people would still be uh, sleeping on the streets. Zena, so many of the images in your report are very much unforgettable. Um, and some in particular, I know, really marked you. Uh, tell us about these images we're going to see now. Um, these images that I chose uh, to show you are uh, images of what I saw when I entered the port. Of course, I had seen the port from the outside on the day of the blast and later on. But when you enter the port, it's quite shocking when you see um, all those cars that, uh, that were uh, in there when the blast happened, uh, all these metal structures that are on the floor. Um, it's really quite impressive. It's quite sad. And it's make you, it makes you realize uh, the extent uh, and the gravity of what happened when you get inside of the port. Now, Zaina, it's believed the explosion was caused by a massive stockpile of fertilizer stored for some reason at the port. Uh, we know there were 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate. That explains the huge scale of the explosion. Uh, but there are still, aren't there, so many unanswered questions. And clearly people perhaps afraid that the truth may not come out. Um, tell us, wh where is the investigation actually up to right now? In the latest developments, uh, the judge investigating the Beirut blast 
Prime Minister Hassan Diab and three former ministers uh, with negligence, uh, causing death of one hundred more than 100 people and uh, injury in more than 1,000 people. Uh, but we have to say that more than four months after the tragedy, we still don't have any uh, real answer uh, about what really happened, despite the fact that uh, 25 uh, um, high-rank officers have been arrested uh, uh, during uh, the investigation. But until now, uh, no clear answer has been given uh, to the Lebanese people. We hope that uh, these, um, the investigation, the ongoing investigation, will shed some light on what happened. Zena, thank you very much indeed. A report by Zena Antonius and Shabel Abouj. You can see it again, of course, on the website france24.com. Beirut is rebuilding, but the people who've lost so much are still searching very much for the truth about the explosion that literally rocked their world. This is Reporters on France 24. Stay with us. Most of all, please stay safe.